just want to welcome Jen Scott um, to our call today and just really excited to have her here. Um, Jen is a registered dietitian. Um, I'll let her give all of her accolades in a minute as well, but she's also a very experienced um, marathon runner, Boston qualifier. And so she is the right person to be talking to us about um, nutrition and fueling in distance training. Um, I followed Jen for a, quite a while on Instagram. Um, if you guys are on Instagram, she is a marathon mama underscore RD. Is that correct, Jen? Okay. So I'll go ahead and put, it'll be in the description of the recording um, along with her website. And I'll make sure I have any other social media outlets where you guys can find her as well. But in particular, Instagram, she shares just tons of really good infographics that I find to be super informative and helpful. Um, just that visual aid of kind of knowing um, when to fuel and things like that. So definitely give her a follow. Um, and then as far as our team, Jen, who you're talking to today, I would say in general, the group is mostly made up of athletes who are on a marathon journey. If they haven't run one yet, they're probably on path to um, run one this year. So it's great timing um, to learn more about nutrition and fueling for those longer distances. I think most everyone's run a half at this point. Um, and then we also have a few people who are, who are pretty seasoned runners as well, um, who have run lots and lots of distances and hand, handful of marathons and everything. And so um, I just ran my 10th marathon um, last weekend. And honestly, I think that was the first time I really say, I think I nailed feeling definitely from following you and others like you. So I appreciate what you do. And so, yeah, I, I know we can all learn a lot from you today. Um, so before I hand it over to Jen, I'm going to let Jacqueline talk really quickly. Um, Jacqueline has worked with Jen guys, um, and had, has had success in her feeling for sure. I've definitely seen differences there with her. I know she has too. So I'll let her take a minute and talk about her experience there. Thanks Jane. Hi Jen. Hi. <laughs> I don't think we ever like did a video chat, so it's nice no. to see you. <laughs> Um, but no, so, um, uh, last spring I was noticing that I was, um, gaining weight and always hungry. And it was like, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm running all this mileage. I'm trying to eat right. Um, but something doesn't make sense. And I don't know how people can run. I, I still haven't run a marathon yet, but I've only done halves, but, um, it was just kind of like how do people run marathons if they're this hungry all the time? Like there must be something that I don't know. Um, so I reached out to Jen. I'd been following her on Instagram for a while and she and I worked together for a couple months and she was amazing. It was just a comprehensive um, overview of like everything. You know, she, she had me kind of track my eating for a couple of days and she was like, Hey, like you're not eating enough. <laughs> So, and just kind of taught me how to like better balance my plates, depending on my activity level of the day, um, balance my meals throughout the day. And, um, I mean, I was having side effects. Like I'd wake up in the middle of the night, um, like wide awake. And I think it was honestly just hunger, you know, like when you're hungry, your stomach wakes you up in the middle of the night. And as soon as I started making some of the changes that she suggested, and I mean, she gave me recipes. Um, she helped me come up with a few plan for all kinds of runs and different lengths of time. Um, you know, I started sleeping through the night again. Um, I feel like the weight gain that I was noticing just kind of stopped. It just, um, you know, I think I'm at the weight I need to be to, to stay injury free at this point, but yeah, like the hunger pains just completely went away. And I, um, I went all this last year was the longest I've ever gone without being injured. Um, I was always injured injury prone and I really attribute that, um, lack of injury with, you know, with Jen's help with make sure I'm making sure I'm fueling properly during the run before, after, um, things like that. So huge thank you to you, Jen, because you've, you've changed my life for the better. <laughs> I appreciate you. 
Yeah, I'm glad it helped. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, um, Jacqueline, for sharing and what a testament and uh, working with Jen and just showing how important fueling is um, when we're running as much as we do. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Jen and let her introduce herself as well. And I've already given her several questions. Um, the ones that I kind of hear the most from you guys, crowdsourcing all of those. So she's ready to answer those. If you guys have um, other questions for her as we go, go ahead and place them in the chat. And I think her plan is to go ahead and answer those towards the end. All right. My name's Jen Scott. I've been a dietitian for 18 years. Um, I've been working mostly with athletes, runners for the past seven years and focusing on sports nutrition. Um, but within that, I work with lots of runners who have different health issues, GI problems, um, new moms, eating disorders, um, ultra runners, just people, you know, across the spectrum that need help with fueling. Um, and then I've been running since I was 17. Um, I'm 42, so what, that's 25 years. I've run 21 full marathons, 40 halves, and a bunch of different 5Ks and 10Ks. Um, I'm a mom of three and a wife, got two dogs, so I stay pretty busy. Awesome. So I will go ahead. I'm going to share my screen, and I made a slideshow that covers all the information that answers the questions that Jane shared with me. But please, you know, as I'm talking, if anything comes up, any random thoughts, questions, even concerns, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll be more than happy to address it when I'm done. All right. Thank you. So I'm gonna cover basic nutrition for runners. There's my credentials, that's my Instagram handle. And then if you're interested, I do have a website, endurancehealthandnutrition.com. You can find random information there. But I'm just gonna kind of cover why, why fueling is important. And I mean, I think kind of we know we need it, right? Like cars need gas, runners need fuel. Um, but really the main source of fuel that we should really focus on is carbohydrate. And that's because carbohydrate is the perf preferred fueling source by the cells. And just the way it's metabolized and used by your cells is really efficient. Um, with protein and fat, your body can use that for energy, but the whole metabolic process to use that as energy, it requires, it still requires carbohydrate and it's just not as efficient. So what we found is with using carbohydrate as fuel. There's tons of research that shows people who are fueling properly with carbohydrate, they can run faster, they run faster for longer, um, and they can just run longer than if you're fasted or using other fueling sources. Uh, using carbohydrate for fuel, it ha actually helps protect your immune system. Uh, when you run for a length, long time, length of time, it actually suppresses your immune system. And research has shown that if you're feeling with carbohydrate during and immediately after, it helps to uh, decrease that immune suppression. So it protects your immune system, helps keep you from getting sick. Um, my dad was a marathon runner and he would always be so sick after his long training runs and after marathons. And I think that's probably just because he wasn't eating enough carbohydrate. He wasn't very good at that. Um, getting enough fuel, it protects your muscles. And that's because in using carbohydrate for energy, it keeps your body from breaking down your muscles because your body is really good at protecting itself and it will get the energy it needs somehow. And so if you're not giving it through carbohydrate, it's gonna go to your muscles and it's gonna start breaking that muscle tissue down for the amino acids to use. And then that increases your risk for injury. And then fueling accurate or adequately will help you. You'll feel good. You know, you're gonna not get as sick. You're not gonna be as injured. Um, you're gonna be able to train year round and train more often. Usually, um, you know, recovery times between runs and even races is a lot shorter if you're fueling properly. 
And this is kind of just a visual of what I just talked about. When you're, when you fuel before your run, that provides the glucose that is readily available for your muscles and cells to use for energy. I use, you know, little sugar cubes for the uh, for glucose to stand in as glucose. Um, but you know, your body also does access glycogen, and that's the form your body stores glucose in in your liver and in your muscles. And your body does access that during your running as well. And to some point, it does use protein and fat. It's not like it's just like someone flips a switch and it's just carbohydrate and then it's just protein and then it's just fat. Your body's drawing on all three um, to some level, but it really wants the carbohydrate and it will use that first. Um, when you're fueling during a run, again, it helps give your body the energy it needs to run fast, run long. It helps prevent the breakdown of muscle tissue. Um, and also too, again, using carbohydrate during your run, it will help your body metabolize body fat for energy more efficiently. It's gonna help that whole process keep going. There's a saying that goes, fat burns in a carbohydrate flame. And that's what they're talking about. And then for fueling after a run, it's really important. It helps replenish the glucose levels in your blood and that's what helps prevent the suppression of the immune system. It helps repair your glycogen stores. So you can, you know, get up and run the next day and it helps, uh, it helps give you your muscles, the protein it needs to repair and to build. Uh, fasting and running or, you know, not taking fuel while you're running. It's just, again, kind of repetitive here, but your body's going to break down your muscles for energy. Uh, and one thing that they've been talking about more that there's more research on is that for women, because exercise um, spikes your cortisol levels, that's just what it naturally does. And that has the cortisol works to kind of help spare your glycogen stores. It's this whole metabolic process. But what they're finding is that with the cortisol level spike, it happens at a greater amount in women and it can trigger your parasympathetic nervous system to read it as you're in danger, like the flight and fight response. And that can lead to some other long-term stress, health, impairment. Um, there still needs to be more research done on that, but that's just something to keep in mind as a woman. Um, men seem to get away with it, but women can uh, feel it in that way. So it's just something to keep in mind as a woman, if you're, you know, going into a run without fuel or you're not fueling during your run that you're, you're at putting yourself at risk for that. Um, and again, your body will break down your muscle tissue for energy, uh, it will use fat and protein, but it's not going to be as fast and that can cause you to feel sluggish and slow. And then if you're not going to eat after your run, that impairs the glycogen stores being repaired. It's going to put you at risk for being sick and you're probably going to feel more sore and more sluggish for your next run. So I'm going to look at what the recommendations are for eating before a run first. Um, and I think most people run, a lot of runners run first thing in the morning and most of us, you know, have 30 minutes, maybe to an hour to get out the door, get on the treadmill. And what's recommended within that time is to eat like 20 to 30 grams of an easily digestible carbohydrate snack and easily digestible means low in fiber, low in fat, low in protein. We're basically looking for straight carbs. So graham crackers, a banana, a bagel, uh, gummy bears. If you have little kids, usually there's stuff like fruit snacks or applesauce pouches or even baby food pouches. Those all work really good. If you tend to be someone who has maybe a more sensitive stomach or you're new to eating before a run, a sports drink can be a really great option. Um, a sports drink with carbohydrate, not like Gatorade Zero or the, you know, no sugar sports drinks. The ones that are regular regular Gatorade, regular Powerade. I think they're, you know, Scratch, Noon. Noon's not as high in carbohydrate, but things like Scratch can work. Um, but what's nice is that it's liquid. It usually gets absorbed. It usually causes minimal GI issues. And you're kind of killing two birds with one stone because you're getting carbohydrate. And then you're also getting fluid. 
If you happen to be maybe an afternoon runner or an after work runner, if you can kind of keep that in mind when you're going to be running and kind of work backwards, you can often figure out what you need to eat before then. So like if it's one to two hours before you're going to run, a small snack or a small meal that's mostly carbs, but has some protein or some fat, that's really good for one to two hours. And you're looking at like 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate, um, less than 10 grams of fat, 10 grams of protein. And this could also apply to like one to two hours before a marathon or a half marathon. That would be a good thing to aim for, for that. And then if it's three to four hours before, usually a pretty solid balanced meal will work. It usually takes about three to four hours for something to digest. And what I usually recommend is if it's been three to four hours since your last meal and you're going to go out and run, it, you should still aim to take, you know, a 20 to 30 gram snack 30 minutes before to kind of help boost your blood glucose levels back up and give your body the immediate energy it needs to run. And on this slide, I just have some more examples of some easily digestible carbohydrate snacks. Um, toast, Swedish fish, Rice Krispie Treat, uh, dates can also work. And then you can also just, you know, slam down a gel if you have some energy gels that you like. Those work too. And these are the recommendations for fueling during a run. And so if your run is less than 45 minutes, you don't necessarily have to take any fuel during the run. You should still take a small snack before. Um, but most of us, even if we're running first thing in the morning, most of us have enough glycogen stores to support us through the 45 minutes. Um, and then you can take water as needed. But when we start to get over the 45, over the one hour mark, then you need to start taking some fuel. And the recommendation is 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. What I usually have my clients do is split that up into smaller amounts. So um, like 15 grams at the 30 minute mark, and then another 15 grams at the hour mark. Um, most gels contain 20 grams of carbs. So often, you know, the general rule of thumb is a gel every 30 minutes if your run's going to be over an hour to two and a half hours. Um, if you are really good at training your gut or you happen to be someone who has like a more stronger gut, a stomach of steel, you can take more of that. Um, sometimes I'll have people ask, is it possible to take too much? I've never seen anyone getting in anywhere close to taking too much. Um, most people are burning 80 to 100 calories per mile. And I've never seen anyone be able to completely replace the amount of energy they're burning while they run. And so I, I usually, I, I don't think that's something you have to be worried about is taking too much. But when your run's over an hour, you do want water. Usually the recommendations for liquid are four ounces every 15 minutes. So that looks like eight ounces of fluid every 30 minutes or 16 ounces over an hour. Some people can get away with less because they don't sweat very much. Some people need more. And then you should look at adding electrolytes, especially if you're a heavy sweater or you're running in a hot and humid environment. Uh, and sodium is basically the most important one we're looking at because that's the one you lose the most of in sweat. And I'll talk a little bit more about sodium and electrolyte recommendations. And then if your run is over two and a half hours, the recommendation is 60 to 90 grams of carb per hour. Um, I have some people that aren't able to get that high and that's fine. Something, I always tell them something is better than nothing. And you can also reach this by doing a combination of sports drink and gels. Um, and it doesn't have to just all be gels or energy, you know, goos or chews. You can do a combination of gels, goos, food. There's, there's different ways. I often usually just work with my clients and I don't have like one thing I recommend. I do whatever works best for my clients and we will try multiple different things, multiple different combinations. And that's often what, you know, I think runners, they give up too easily. Um, they start to have some GI distress and they give up and they don't try or um, 
they feel like I, I just can't, I can't do it. And, and I, you know, I'm going to talk about GI distress right now, because that's pretty much the number one thing that keeps runners from fueling. Um, you know, again, they take a gel or they try something once it gives them a stomach ache and they give up. Like, I can't do it. I just, my stomach can't handle it. And I've worked with lots of people who come to me saying that, that they have not been able to find a fuel or they've tried these goos and it gives them diarrhea or stomach cramps, or they feel like they're going to throw up. And often what I find is that they're they're maybe taking a goo that doesn't work or it, they might be more sensitive to the different ingredients in it. So we try a different brand. Um, they might be eating too much fiber before and that's causing the GI issue. They're eating a meal with too much protein or fat before their run and then that's actually causing the GI issue. Um, sometimes they're just taking their gel that's you know only got 60 milligrams of sodium and water and that causes GI issues because you need sodium to help absorb those gels. Um, sometimes it's the caffeine causing GI issues. Sometimes it's just being dehydrated. You didn't drink enough the day before. You didn't drink enough before you went out. You didn't drink enough during. Um, and then also just not taking the gels or energy chews with enough fluids. The gels and the energy chews, they're actually kind of you know, should be thought of like concentrated energy drinks, concentrated sports drinks, and they need to be diluted with fluid to reach the correct concentration to be absorbed. And there used to be, you know, a lot of them should be taken just with water, it's like you wash them down just with water, but you still can drink sports drinks along with it as part of your energy plan. I usually just recommend people kind of space it out. So you know, at 15 minutes, you're taking a couple gulps of Gatorade, and then 15 minutes later, you're taking the sports chews with water. There are some people that have trained their guts to take the gels or chews with energy drinks, but um, that's just kind of a really common thing I see with runners, that they're not taking the gels or chews with enough uh, fluid. Um, and again, you know, you haven't something else that causes GI issues is just not taking the time to train your gut. Um, sometimes it takes weeks or months to figure out what works. And that's usually best to kind of do that at the beginning of a training cycle or at an off season. Um, a lot of times I'll have runners that realize they need help training their gut and they'll come to me right at the beginning of their marathon training cycle. And we immediately start looking at how to train their gut and you have to be really consistent with it too. What I usually recommend is that you pick one product and you start with it and you stick with it maybe for two weeks. And then if it's really not working, then let's pick something else and let's go with something else. And you have to use it pretty consistently. Like I usually recommend that people, you can take it. Most people think they can only take gels on long runs, but I often will recommend that people take it on shorter runs because if it happens to be that it, you know, gives you diarrhea, you can get make it home a lot better, a lot faster if you're on a shorter run than if you're six miles from home, right? And then get hit with diarrhea. Um, so the, I like to encourage people to try it on, on shorter runs and not just wait for the long run. And then another thing that can cause GI distress is pain meds, uh, especially ibuprofen. If you're taking that before a run that, and then, you know, you go take a gel, that's definitely going to cause stomach issues. So it's good to rule all these things out and not just jump immediately to blaming a gel or, or you know, thinking that your gut can't handle fuel. And these are some steps. These are usually the steps I go through with my clients on how to train your gut. Um, you know, usually try to figure out the amount of carbs and fluid they're going to need ultimately. So you know, if we look at what the half marathon fueling plan goal is, we look at that. If it's marathon, then, you know, it's a little bit more, but we'll look at that and then we'll break it down into half. And that's usually a really good starting point if you've, or if you're not using to take, you're not used to taking fuel at all. So for instance, if you're going to run a half marathon um, and we're looking at taking a gel every 30 minutes, then what we'll aim to do is to take half a gel every 30 minutes and make sure 
you're taking that with enough fluid. And then once, you know, they've done that a couple of times and it starts to feel like they can handle it, then we start to increase it. And I like to remind people too, that you're going to have some discomfort if you've never taken fuel during your run. That's just the way it's going to be. You're going to have some discomfort. That's not unusual, um, but you have to get through it. You have to go through it to get through it. Like you've, you've got to hang in there um, and it will get better. There's tons of research to show that people can train their guts to take large volumes of fluid and fuel. And I, I haven't seen anyone, I haven't encountered anyone yet that hasn't been able to train their gut to take fuel and fluid. Um, and again, you wanna gradually increase the amount until you can tolerate the recommended full amounts and practice on all the runs you can. You know, you can practice on all runs over 60 minutes, but it's not gonna hurt anything. And it's, there's a lot of benefits to doing it on runs shorter than 60 minutes. And again, you gotta be consistent. You gotta hang in there. And so with electrolytes, um, electrolyte replacement is pretty important on runs lasting over an hour. Um, if you're not, replacing your fluids lost or the electrolytes, it can cause a decrease in your performance. Losing just 2% of your body weight can result in a decrease in performance. And again, sodium and chloride or salt, thats those are the ones that you lose at the highest amount in your sweat. And that's the one we really need to pay the most attention to. Um, you know, most people with potassium, a lot of the gels have that automatically in them and it's in an amount that's fine or people are getting enough in like the banana they eat before and it's not lost in high amounts in your sweat and if you're having cramps it's really rarely often is because of potassium they've done research on that and um, people like to blame loss of potassium for muscle cramps but it's usually you're not getting enough sodium because that also can cause cramps or it's just muscle fatigue And so the reason sodium is so important is it helps in absorption. It helps transport glucose across the intestinal wall. So if you feel like, you know, you take gels and fluid and you're kind of sloshy, that is usually a pretty good sign that you're not getting enough sodium. Um, and then also sodium within your bloodstream helps the cells absorb glucose. So it helps, you know, in two different ways. Um, Again, you know, not getting enough sodium can cause cramps. It can also can cause diarrhea, um, not getting enough sodium. You know, in extreme situations, it can lead to passing out. It can lead to brain damage and even death. That doesn't happen very often, um, but it's just, you know, on the extreme end of not getting enough sodium. Recommended sodium intake during runs, it ranges anywhere from 250 to 750 milligrams per hour. Um, often you can, there's different ways you can have your sweat rate tested. Gatorade even has these patches. They're not super accurate, but it's data. It can give you some kind of idea of how much sodium you're losing. Um, I often will make an estimate based on my client's sweat rates. And if you happen to want to measure your sweat rate, what you would do is you would measure yourself naked before you go out on a run and then keep track of what fluid you drink during your run and then measure yourself naked when you get back. And for every pound lost, that means you've lost about two cups of fluid. And that's kind of how you can figure out your sweat rate and maybe um, what you need to aim for to replace. And you also need to add in the water you took. Um, I, I didn't write the equation anyone here anywhere here, but if you guys want it, I can write it out or share it. It's also on my Instagram page. But some athletes do find like they need as much as a thousand milligrams per hour. That's pretty rare, but I have seen that. And so eating after your run, um, usually I like to tell people the sooner the better, but the main issue that I hear from people is that they're just not hungry after a run. And so usually with the best thing to do if you can is as soon as you can get just a snack in with a ratio of carb to protein that's three to one. So 
um, usually like 15, 30 grams of carb to you know 10 grams of protein. And that's kind of exactly what chocolate milk has. Um, there's different recovery drinks out there by scratch or you can um, also like a bowl of cereal. Those things, most people can force down within 45 minutes. Liquids are a great option for that. Um, and then you know, go take your shower, kind of recover a little bit more and then come back and eat a balanced meal within two to three hours. That's a really good way to meet your recovery needs get your body the carbohydrate it needs to repair your glycogen stores to again you know help decrease the immunosuppression that you might be feeling and then also the protein is a pretty key part of the recovery meal because you need that to repair your muscles and you need at least 20 to 25 grams to provide you with enough of the amino acid leucine and leucine is kind of like the light switch for muscle synthesis. And you need 20 to 25 grams for it to kind of flip that on into your body for your body to make more muscle. So I usually like to encourage my clients to at least get 20 to 25 grams of protein within their recovery meals. And so now I'm gonna cover carb loading. Um, it's most important for marathons or any races that are going to last over four hours. Um, carb loading needs to start two to three days before a race. I think old school method used to be to cram in, you know, a giant pasta dinner the night before. I remember that's what my dad used to do, but it actually needs to start two to three days before. Um, it's not necessary for a 5k or a 10k you can get away with just eating, you know, a carbohydrate rich dinner the night before. Again, you don't have to go stuff yourself, but, you know, try to focus more on carbohydrates. So pasta would be a good dinner. Um, <clears throat> and then for a half marathon, I often will recommend that people do a mini carb load or just aim to try to carb load like for one day before. Um, and for carb loading, you don't have to increase your calorie intake. Like it doesn't have to be a huge increase. We just want to make sure that the proportion of your calories coming from carbohydrate is more. So instead of like 60% of your total calories coming from carbohydrate, which is kind of the regular day-to-day -day recommendation for runners, it needs to be like 80 to 90%. So it looks like you're just eating mostly carbs all day. It's good to aim for lower fiber carbohydrate sources because that can help prevent residue and diarrhea happening while you run. Um, sports drinks can be a really great thing to include as part of your carb loading because it's going to help. It's an easy way. It's liquid way to get carbohydrate. It's going to help kind of preload you with sodium and the sodium will help retain water. And you may feel like kind of bloated and sluggish and slow and heavy. Um, but that means your body's loaded up on fluid. It means it's loaded up on carbohydrate and that will burn off pretty fast into that marathon. And you'll be happy you did that before. Um, and you know, carbohydrate dense foods are what we really need to focus on breads, bagels, rice, pasta, bananas, potatoes, crackle crackers, pretzels, plantains, any of those starchy foods will work. And I have a plate diagram here to kind of give you more of an idea of just how the percentage of carbohydrate, like the proportion, it's, you know, what most of your meals should be. And to actually figure out the amount of grams you should be aiming for each day, if you want to do numbers, it's three to 3.6 to 5.5 grams of carb per pound of body weight or eight to 12 grams per kilogram. So for example, if you're a 150 pound runner, that's anywhere from 540 to 800 grams of carbohydrate. And again, you know, it's a little, little fat, a little bit of protein, mostly carbohydrate. And the whole reason carb loading is important is because it helps prevent you from hitting the wall. And I try to make a visual of like what can happen if you just carb load and you don't use fuel. What we have found is that there's an, if you carb load properly, 
you have enough in your glycogen stores to get you about three to four hours into the marathon, and then it's gone. And that's often where people hit the wall, right? Right around the 20 mile mark. And that's because your glycogen stores are gone. If you don't properly carb load, and let's say you're just gonna focus on fueling, you're gonna hit the wall a lot sooner. Uh, your glycogen stores are only gonna get you so far and the fueling will help preserve your glycogen for a little bit, but it's not gonna get you all the way to the end. It's probably not gonna get you to the 20 mile mark either. But with carb loading and fueling, you know, you've got the amount to get you 20 miles. And if you're taking the gels as you should, it helps prolong your glycogen stores all the way to the end. And I've seen it so many times where my runners, they carb load accurately, they fuel, they follow their fueling plan and they get to the end and they say they feel strong, they feel energized, they PR. Um, it just, it's really nice to see, you know, it's the science in action and it works. It's, you know, over and over again. So one thing though that, um, I feel like comes up a lot with runners is especially marathon runners. And I always warn people during carb loading too, is weight gain, weight gain during half marathon training, weight gain during marathon training. And this happens often. Um, and it can be for different reasons. It can be because you've gained muscle mass. Muscle is denser than fat tissue. So with the intensity of marathon training, it wouldn't be, you know, most of us will gain more lean body mass and that will make the scale go up. Um, the increased glycogen stores, especially during carb loading, but it does happen throughout marathon training as well. If you're fueling like you should before, during, and after your runs, your body will increase your glycogen stores. And that's good because that means you've got more fuel to hold you as you come to race day. Um, you know, it's like getting a, increasing your gas tank on your car. You can go further, right? But Glycogen stores water. So for every gram of glycogen, it stores three grams of water. So you will see weight go up and that's, it's just water weight. Um, it can be from inflammation. Again, exercise automatically causes inflammation and that's kind of part of the adaptation process. But if you have chronic inflammation because you're not fueling adequately, uh, you're not recovering adequately, it can cause weight gain just from different um, metabol metabolic processes being interrupted and also water retention. Another thing that can happen for weight gain during training is being too restrictive. You're not eating enough. And, um, you know, again, your body's really efficient at protecting itself and at getting what it needs. And so often what happens is if you're too restrictive, at some point in the day, or at some point in your week, you will find yourself binge eating or overeating. And it becomes this cycle where you get really hungry, you overeat. And then, you know, after a while, that calorie surplus leads to weight gain. And it's, um, it's almost kind of like what Jacqueline shared, like when she had more balanced meals, the weight gain, you know, petered off. Um, you, you don't be too restrictive in your diet. And the other thing to consider too is just that your initial weight was too low. Some of us, you know, our goal weight is just not at the way our body actually wants to be and is healthy at or can perform well at. Um, and sometimes you have to do a little bit more digging at that. You know, if you, to be at your initial weight requires you not to eat enough, uh, you're tired, you're sluggish, you know, and you find that you gain weight when you're actually eating adequately and exercising more, that's probably a good sign that that goal weight or that initial weight is not the healthy weight for your body. Um, I do have some people that come to me and they want to lose weight during training. And it's, um, it's not that that's not a possibility. It can be done. Um, but I usually will warn people that it's very slow. We have to take it very cautiously. And it's, you know, maybe half a pound a week or less. And um, I usually let them know too, in doing that, that you're not going to, you're not going to be PRing. You're not going to be running faster. You're probably um, not going to feel as energetic on your runs. 
And I also am really, I let them know that it could put you at an increased risk of injury. And so we also will keep tight tabs on how they feel they're recovering, how they feel like they're digesting their food. Because that's another thing, if you're not eating enough, it will impact your GI system. Being too restrictive in your diet, cutting too many calories, that impacts your gut and it can cause a lot of GI issues. And so we keep track of all those things to see if this is even something that they should be doing. But like I said, it's not like it can't be done. We just have to be really careful. But often, you know, some people will start running or they wanna train for something because they wanna lose weight. And if you do that and you are cutting too many calories, you can actually end up with something called relative energy deficiency in sport. And this is kind of just a visual to show, you know, you have so much energy, your body needs so many calories just to breathe and do all its functions and to walk around. And then it needs additional energy for training and for your sports activity. And if that becomes your total energy requirement, but if you're like the calorie restriction you decide to follow is too low, you end up with relative energy deficiency. And so signs of that are prolonged low calorie intake, low body fat percentage. For females, you can see a longer period of time between your menstrual cycles or your menstrual cycles go away. You're getting injured more, stress fact fractures, disordered eating behaviors, reduced bone mineral density, and again, you know, a loss or absence of your period. And I have seen this happen in runners of all ages um, and at all body weights. You know, I think that's something to keep in mind. It's not just ultra lean, ultra thin runners that this happens to. Everyone's body has a weight that it's happy at. And when you get too low or if you're starving yourself too much, your body will start to show these signs. Some risks are impaired immune function, endocrine dysfunction. I've had people develop um, thyroid problems from eating too low calories while trying to train for something. GI distress and dysfunction, decreased bone health. Amenorrhea is what we call it when you go more than three months without a period. Impaired growth and development, this, that's a little bit more for teens. Um, increased heart disease risk. It can cause depression and anxiety, metabolic impairment. Again, it can affect your thyroid. Um, and then just, it can also, you know, greater than three, five days between your cycles. How it impacts your performance. Like, and these are the things I'll keep an eye on with my clients. Decreased endurance, increased injury, decreased training response. Um, and that looks like, you know, you're working really hard, but you're not getting any faster. You're endurance isn't increasing, that's usually a pretty good sign that you're, you know, overtraining or you're not eating enough. Decreased concentration, trouble with your memory, depression, decreased glycogen stores, decreased muscle tone, increased irritability, decreased coordination, like it really starts to mess things up. This is just something I like to remind people because a lot of people think, well, oh, if I just lose some weight, I'll be faster. And really, what we found in research shows is that being well fueled is going to help you run much faster than losing a couple pounds ever will. And that's it. I can take questions now. Thank you so much, Jen. That was so valuable. I wrote down lots of notes. I'm sure everyone did. Um, we do have a few questions, so I will let them, um, ask them, where did I lose my chat? Let's see. Um, well, Dan asked, is Dan still here? Dan just asked if we can get a copy of your PowerPoint, Jen. Yep. Yeah. I'll email that to you and then you can distribute it as you want. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, and I will say to a lot of, um, those infographics are exactly what you'll find too on her Instagram page. So, um, yeah, love those super helpful. Um, Tiffany, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. So many helpful tips and things to think about. So I also took a bunch of notes, but I was curious, similar to how you would maybe carb load leading into a race. 
thinking about hydration, and I know you mentioned, I think it's, you said four ounces every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Would that look the same if you were maybe front loading hydration at the same time? Or what would be kind of your recommendations for kind of taking a potential similar approach with sodium or just hydration pre race? Um, if I that makes probably, sense. I would probably still, um, I mean, I have some people, like I said, with lower height, uh, sweat rates, four ounces is the average, but some people can, you know, get away with the two to three ounces, but I would still try to keep the same amount of hydration during your race. Um, the benefit of being, you know, front loading hydration, which is a great idea, whether it's fluid and sodium or both along with a carbohydrate is that it's just going to make you more prepared and really decrease the risk of hitting the wall or, you know, getting dehydrated or feeling like garbage during your race. So I would still stick to about the same amount. The benefit though, too, with front loading would be if you happen to get sick to your stomach or something, then it would mm -hmm. probably um, help prevent you from feeling as awful if you weren't able to take as much hydration. So it could be more like even just a safety net if something happened during the race. Helpful. Thanks, Jen. Can you repeat that, Jen? Was it four ounces every 15 minutes? Yeah, what it's a recommendation. Roughly about four ounces every 15 minutes. And they say like one gulp is about one ounce. And to, you know, you don't have to try to gulp all four at exactly the 15 minute mark. You know, you can definitely take sips throughout. If you can kind of roughly average it out to about that, that's fine. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then Jacqueline had a question. Can I ask you a question? Oh, I just said, is it a good idea to take Martin gels um, with water? Like I know they claim that you don't need to because of whatever proprietary concoction it is. And I think there's some other products out there that say like, oh, you don't need to take water with this. But I just wondered if, if you know, it's still a good idea to take water with it or it can be a good idea. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, you can you can definitely get away with taking them without water. Uh, so it could maybe help alleviate if you're feeling pretty anxious about the timing of everything. Um, but you're still definitely going to need water. And you're definitely going to need some kind of sodium source. Thank you. Anyone else have um, anything? If you want to just jump in and ask. Um... I have one I'll ask, but I'll wait for everyone else to get their questions. This is the time. Don't be shy. I have a question. If you were taking like a Morton gel and you were trying to take like a Morton gel and like a drink of some kind, like let's say Tailwind, mm -hmm. would it be a bad idea to try those together? Should you try them systematically like one at a time? Should you try like one in isolation, or can you take them at the same time or does that depend on the person? It depends on the person and you could, the best thing to do would be to play around with that in training. Um, I think, you know, off the top of my head, I think, you know, taking the tailwind and then 15 minutes later, taking the Martin gel and then 15 minutes later, taking the tailwind, kind of dividing it by 15 minutes could help uh, prevent any kind of GI issues, but you could definitely train your gut to take it with the tailwind. Um, but yeah, you could start with it towards combining it if that's something you wanted to do. Okay. Well, that's my question. Um, so I think something that I hear a lot is, and I mean, you obviously fully covered how important it is to fuel, but what do you say to someone who comes to you and um, says, well, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry during the run. I never get hungry during an hour and a half. So it just must be me. I can do that. You know, I always say it's one of those, like, just because you can, doesn't mean you should situations. Um, yeah. And I think sometimes the way I see it, you talked a little bit about, um, now I can't remember what you said exactly, but I don't know. I don't know if it's this feeling around like we're so trained or something like don't overeat and like, I'm not hungry, so I shouldn't. So what would you say in those situations? Yeah. So usually I like to remind people that during exercise, your hunger and full cues are not reliable. 
um, because exercise, the hormones that are released during exercise will suppress your appetite. So that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean that just because you're not hungry doesn't mean that you shouldn't eat. And then I also, you know, like to just throw out, well, if you feel like you can perform well without fuel, can you imagine how much better you could perform with fuel? Like you'd probably blow it out of the park, right? Like I had someone who could run a 315 marathon with no fuel. And I was like, can you, you're going to do like great, you know, and she could run a sub three with fuel. So, you know, um, like you said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Ultimately, it's up to the person, you know, it's your body. You can do whatever you want. But if you really, you know, you're leaving that whole thing unexplored, right? Why not try to tap out your potential, right? Yeah, I love how you said that because, yeah, I mean, obviously, for the most part, the people that I'm working with have these high goals and everything, right? So, um, yeah, exactly how you said. Imagine what you could do if you did fuel well. Um, yeah, and I think sometimes it does. Oh, what you had said that people are afraid, right? Or they're or they have GI distress, and so they just don't. And it does come back to that. Yeah, training. and I also like to, you know, when you run, watch the elite marathoners, they're taking fuel. So yeah. if anyone could get away with it, it would probably be them and they're taking fuel. So if they need it, we probably do too. 100%. Well, I will wrap it up with, um, I quoted you say, seeing the science in action when you said that you've worked with so many runners who have these success stories of having these you know, having energy in those, in that last 10 K and avoiding the wall and having a PR and feeling amazing. Um, that's it. What that's what it's all about right there. Um, and so, yeah, we'll just finish it there. Thank you so much, Jen. This was extremely valuable. And I know the team is going to take a lot away from it as well as, um, all the YouTube viewers and everything else. So thank you so much again yeah. for being here. Thanks for having um, me. And like I said, I will go ahead and put, I know she put it in the PowerPoint, but I'll, I'll put those in the description of the recording of this too. If you guys want to reach out to Jen or just follow her um, on Instagram or her website.